Yeah. Thank you all so much for coming out and supporting your local independent bookstore. You cannot have a bad day either at your local independent bookstore in the past. It's one of the, I think it's in your book too. <laughs> one of the things you can do. Um, this evening, Book Passage is delighted to welcome Alan Klein, renowned speaker, best selling author, and the only certified jollytologist in existence in, in the world. So he'll be explaining that to us tonight. He is author of over 25 uplifting and thoughtfully written books, including Inspiration for a Lifetime, Change Your Life, and The Healing Power of Humor. His latest book promises to be his best yet. It's titled You Can't Ruin My Day. 52 wake-up calls to turn any situation around. The book is filled with practical wisdom and insight, and it's really an invaluable resource for anyone interested in living a life of less stress and much more joy. So with that, I ask you to warmly welcome Alan Klein. Where can we buy the book? <laughs> So I was wondering, how many of you had a, let things like this ruin your day from time to time? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> or this. So um, I'm going to show you tonight some of the techniques, we can't do all 52, but some of the techniques to help you get through that not-so-funny stuff in your life. I forgot that there's a microphone here. Um, help you get through that not-so-funny stuff in your life. And um, to start with, I want to talk about the backstory of the book, because a lot of authors, you know, you just don't write a book. Something happens, and, and, and it kind of spurs you to write, write the book. So what happened is I was on my... Um, Excuse me, one minute. I like to walk around a bit, so. <laughs> I was, it was a Saturday morning. I was going to the gym. I was really happy. I had just seen Billy Elliot and bought the album, and I was listening to it on the, um, in my car. And I'm on Geary Street, and I go, if you, if you know Geary Street in San Francisco, I go through the tunnel, and I come out the other side, and a cop is pulling me over for speeding, because before the tunnel, it's 35 miles an hour. After the tunnel, it's 25 miles an hour. I didn't know this, and I was doing 40 miles an hour. <laughs> so uh, the cop pulls me over, and I get the ticket, and I go to the gym, and I'm still singing uh, Electricity, Electricity from uh, Billy Elliot. And, um, people, and I tell the people at the gym, I just got a speeding ticket, and they're going, how could you be so happy? And how could you be singing? You just got a speeding ticket. And all of a sudden, a light bulb went on in my head. <laughs> and I realized how often we give our power away to situations or to other people, and it takes away our happiness. And so um, I told that to a friend of mine who's in the audience tonight, Noreen Halvey. And she said, the book is really her fault. <laughs> she said, Alan, that would make a great book. Because I, I, I said to the people at the gym, I'm not going to let that cop or that ticket ruin my day. And she said, that's a great title, that's a great book. So you could all thank uh, uh, Noreen for that. <laughs> so, the book story. So, started writing the book. Three years later, it got published this Thursday, wow. and um, it has a cast of 303,205 characters, and if you don't have a computer, that's 67, 800 words. So it's, um, it's quite a book, and uh, it's, it's not, you know, not too thin. <laughs> um, so the, the, I was thinking about the, you know, because those, those those uh, things like the themes, it's 52 themes, and I was thinking, okay, the themes, but how do they all relate? How could I put these together? And so I gave it to my agent, and the agent said, 
well, you're the world's only jolly tologist, yet you have very little humor in this book. <laughs> so I thought, oh, well, that's, I could lighten it up. And I thought, okay, so each theme has a lighten up. Each theme has what I started to call a wake-up call, not just a theme, because I realized that with a wake-up call is really something that causes us to become fully alert to an unsatisfactory situation and to take action to remedy it. So I start coming up with all these wake-up calls. And these are just some of them in the book. Make it a red nose day, move your fear to the rear, stop complaining, dump the gunk, chill out, uh, supersize that. That's just some of them. And if you want to stay till midnight, I can go over all of them. <laughs> um, so then I thought, OK, I have a wake up call. I have a lighten up. What else can be in each of those sections? So I thought, OK, something that the reader could do after, re after uh, reading about the wake up call. So what happened was I came up with wake up call, follow up, and then lighten up. And then as far as laying out the whole book, I realized, well, naturally, it would have a start up at the beginning and a wind up at the end. And then the first part would be the wake up calls like to get you into the book. And then maybe a little more media ones. So that would be like wising up. And then growing up not, because I believe we really should grow down as adults, that children are really great teachers. So I call that grow up not. And then Crack Up, which is all about humor and the various things you can do, like the Red Nose Day, to get more humor in your life. And then, of course, the Wrap Up, the final things that I wanted to say about um, that. So I put all that together, and it really was a nice little package. And I was finally happy to submit the book to the publisher. A friend of mine just uh, looked at the book, and she said, you know, what are you going to do for a sequel? She said, maybe you could do You Can Ruin My Day. So the various chapters would be muck up, mess up, spit up, throw up, or F up. Now I know some of you are thinking what F is for. You're wrong. It's for fork up. So I um, told you the story of the back story, but I also want to tell you my story because you know, I'm only human, and lots of things have come in my life that have looked like they're going to ruin my day uh, over the years. So I want to tell you just one of them. And when I was uh, about seven years old, I grew up in New York City, and my parents took me to see my first Broadway shows. One was Oklahoma, and one was Carousel. And I remember the second show, we got in late, and uh, my father couldn't find parking, and we got in late, and I refused to leave the theater at the end of the show. I thought it was like a movie. <laughs> and you sit there, and you can see the beginning again. And that wasn't true, of course. And so that had to drag me kicking and screaming out of the theater. But what I loved, and what that little uh, outing taught me or showed me was those pretty pictures on stage. And from then on, I wanted to be a scenic designer. I wanted to create those pictures. I mean, other kids in school wanted to be a doctor, a lawyer. I wanted to be a scenic designer, a teacher of what is that? But anyhow, I would take little shoe boxes or cigar boxes, and I would make those little pictures about the book we were reading in school. So I was a, started to be a scenic designer. And then I got into Yale Drama School, which is one of the most prestigious theater schools in the country. It's a three-year master's. And at the end of the first year, the professor said, well, we're not, we're not inviting you back the next year. And so I was heartbroken. And I left Yale, and I went back to New York City where I lived. I got into the Scenic Design Union, and I was designing Captain Kangaroo, Merv Griffin, Jackie Gleason shows, and my fellow students were still at school designing school productions. And I realized looking back, I mean, I didn't realize at the time, but I realized looking back, no one could ruin my day. Donald Owenslager, the head of the scenic design department, could not say I wasn't a scenic designer. I, was, I had created that in my own mind since I was seven years old. So I realized now, looking back, no one could ruin my day even then. And by the way, this is me <laughs> with hair. <laughs> 
Um, so there's another story I want to tell you about. And I want to ask you, what if suddenly after you left tonight you got a call that every penny you had saved your whole life was gone? That you had no money left? Would that ruin your day? Yeah. Sure. Yes, it would. Okay, I want to tell you another story about a couple that did not let that ruin their day. It's Matt Weinstein and Janine Roth. And um, they found they had all their money in Madoff, invested with Madoff, and they got a call saying it's all gone. And Janine Roth writes about how it did not let her ruin her day. Matt Weinstein, I'm sorry, um, although, here's what Janine said. Although I never would have chosen the path of losing our life savings, she says, no matter what Bernie Madoff had stolen, no matter what I had lost or what I had left, I can only suffer to the degree that I allowed myself to fly off the ragged cliffs of my mind. If that's for me, tell them I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, um, and, and then I wrote this book. And what Roth ultimately learned is what her spiritual teacher told her from the very beginning. I promise you that nothing of any value is lost. In spite of having 30 years of savings go down the drain in an instant, Roth noted that she could still breathe. In this moment, I could still see. In this moment, there were still trees and wind and ground and birds. I had legs and arms, and she says jokingly, and chocolate. <laughs> and Matt Weinstein did a brilliant, um, you'll see it in a moment, a brilliant little piece on uh, the money they lost. We even uses a lot of humor um, dealing with that. This past December, I went on vacation in Antarctica on this ship, the Academic Yuffie, a Russian icebreaker, and it was an incredible voyage. Gorgeous icebergs, like floating works of art, and penguins running around all over the place, and just spectacular, spectacular scenery. And about halfway through the trip, I got a page to go up to the bridge for a satellite phone call, and I thought I knew what this was about. Before I left on the trip, I had been working with the Speakers Bureau on a series of dates, and they were supposed to call me if they needed my final approval on the deal. So I went kind of running up towards the bridge, up this fleet, steep flight of stairs, because I knew these satellite phone calls were $10 a minute. And at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, this is kind of cool, doing business in Antarctica. But when I pick up the phone, it's not the Speakers Bureau. It was, in fact, my wife Janine and she said a few words to me that just totally turned my world upside down she said to me Bernie Madoff's been arrested his entire fund is a complete scam and what she didn't have to say but which both of us knew very well in that moment was we had just lost our entire life savings I felt really sick inside Janine and I had both started out with nothing, worked really hard for 30 years, built up our retirement fund, given it over to Bernie Madoff to invest. He was the former chairman of the NASDAQ. What could be safer than that? And it was gone, just like that. Turned out, Bernie Madoff stole $65 billion. Not all of it was mine, however. <laughs> but it turned out to be the biggest financial scam in history, totally dwarfing anything like Enron or WorldCom. We both were really anxious about the future. We didn't know if we could afford to keep living in our house. Just everything was up in the air. And after a few minutes, one of us had the presence of mind to say to the other one, you know what? We are no longer the kind of people who can afford to talk on the satellite telephone. <laughs> At $10 a minute. <laughs> so we hung up. And as soon as I hung up, oh, just a wave of fear washed over me. You know, wherever I've traveled in the world, I've always been able to get home during an emergency, but this was the Antarctica. 
There was no way to get home. Now, I did have some good friends on the ship, and of course I told them what was going on, and they were incredibly supportive. But you know what? They were on vacation. I was thinking about Bernie Madoff 24-7, and they didn't want to be hearing Madoff, Madoff, Madoff all the time. Now, two or three times a day, we did get to go to shore in these rubber Zodiac boats, and I thought, okay, at least I can go out in nature. I can go see this beauty. It's going to really help me forget about what's going on. But that didn't really work out, because everywhere I went, all I could see was bird. bird, bird. <laughs> As one of my friends later said, Matt finally traveled to the South Pole just in, si just in time to see his investments go even further south. <laughs> And he goes on, but I, I want to show you a little of that, because they handled it so well, they did not let that ruin the day. And Matt says, yes, Bernie Madoff stole our money, but it was up to us to make sure he didn't steal the rest of our lives. That he didn't steal the rest of our lives. Don't let anyone ruin your day or ruin your life. If there's one thing I hope people get out of this book, there, and that is that there is no inherent meaning to any thought or action, that you assign a meaning to everything. You assign a meaning, a meaning to everything. I'll give you an example of that, um, of a story in the book about two ships, shoe salesmen. You may have um, heard this before, but um, it really illustrates this. Two salesmen worked for a competing shoe company. Both went, were sent to a separate remote part of the world when neither company had any salespeople. When they arrived, they both realized that this territory was unlike any other they had ever seen before. The people in the region went barefoot all the time. No one wore any shoes. As soon as the salesmen realized the situation, both sent their home office a message to inform them of the situation. The messages, however, were quite different. One salesperson re uh, message read, don't send any more shoes, no one here wears any. The other message said, send all the shoes you can, no one here wears any. <laughs> And then I have my little note. Um, both men experienced the same situation, yet each reacted in a totally different way. Two different reactions to the same situation. Each interpreted the situation differently, so it is not the event that can ruin your day, it is how you react to it. It's not the event, it's how you react. I was just reading a, book, a new book by Jack Canfield, and I love, he has this in his book, E plus R equals uh, O. And basically what he's saying is, the event is the event, and it's your response to it that creates the outcome. You can't change the event, you can change your response, and that's the only thing that will change the outcome. So one of the wake-up calls I have is reframe to remain sane. So, okay, so you're going along and everything's fine and all of a sudden you bunk into something and you realize there is some obstacle and you have a choice. What are you going to do to, to get this out of your life? And so sometimes you might hit it, you might kick it, you might pray that it goes away, you might knock it over, you might try to squish it and sit on it. And by the way, folks, what I'm talking, this is a metaphor. It's not a chair. <laughs> it's a metaphor for something that blocks your life. Um, but it, again, it's what he's saying, that it, it's, this is the event, and it's the way you react, your response to it, that causes the outcome. So you always, it's always up to you. It's not the thing itself. I love what Wayne Dyer says. 
In the scheme of things, what you do and whether you are angry or not will have all the impact of another glass of water being thrown <laughs> over Niagara Falls. Whether you choose laughter or anger will not matter much, except that the former will fill your present moments with happiness and the latter will waste them in misery. You always have that choice. I think we forget that, but we have the choice. So, um, three questions I want to ask you about that. Does getting angry when you're angry or upset, <coughs> does it serve you? And the next time you're angry or upset, you might want to ask these, one of these, at least one of these three questions. Does it serve you? Does being upset or angry contribute to your well-being? Does being angry or upset bring more joy into your life? So just, just, you know, that can change everything around if you keep answering, no, it doesn't serve me, no, it doesn't help my well-being or bring joy into my life. Um, I have another little story here that kind of illustrates that. This is from the um, humor section. A man and a woman had been married for more than 50 years. They kept no secrets from each other, except that the woman had a shoebox in the top of her closet that she had cautioned her husband never to open or ask her about it. For all these years, he never thought about the box, but one day the woman got sick and the doctor said she would never recover. In trying to sort out their affairs, the man took down the shoebox and brought, uh, and brought it to his wife's bedside. She agreed that it was time for he, that he should know what was in the box. When he opened it, he found two crocheted dolls and $95,000 in cash. He asked her about the contents. When we were married, she said, my grandmother told me the secret of a happy marriage was to never, never argue. She told me that if I ever got angry with you, I should just keep quiet and crochet a doll. The man was so moved he had uh, to fight back tears. Only two precious dolls were in the box. She had only been angry twice with him in all those years. Honey, he said, that explains the dolls, but what about all the money? Where did it come from? Oh, she said, that's the money I made from selling the dolls. <laughs> <laughs> so another one of uh, the techniques is put it in neutral. You know, when your car is in neutral, it doesn't go back, it doesn't go forward. You don't get entangled in the anger or the fight or whatever it is in the traffic jam uh, with someone else. I, I love this quote. Uh, an anonymous, that famous writer wrote this. Handle every stressful situation like a dog. If you can't eat it or play with it, pee on it and walk away. <laughs> So you can walk away. I remember a friend of mine, by the way, this statue I saw, in, it's in Budapest. It's actually a statue of anonymous. You know how they have all these okay. authors statues? Without a face. So I really liked it. Um, so a friend of mine years ago, when I was writing my first book, The Healing Power of Humor, I didn't have a lot of time. I had a deadline. I was writing and writing. And I guess for about three months, I didn't call him. I didn't write him. I didn't, you know, I just needed to get the book done. So he called me up and he said, Alan, I'd like to see you. Let's have coffee. And we sat down and he presented me a list with 72 items of why he never wanted to be my friend or see me again. <laughs> and he started reading them off. You didn't send me a birthday card. You didn't do this. And with each one, I became neutral. Instead of arguing, yeah, I didn't send the card. Yeah, I didn't have time. I just, yeah, you're right. I didn't do that. Yeah, you're right. I didn't do that. And the more I kind of just was neutral, the angry he became. <laughs> and then he stormed out of the restaurant and uh, got to his car and he got a speeding, uh, a parking ticket. <laughs> um, we're now friends again and we use that as a joke and when some, either one of us does something we don't like that the other's done, we go, okay, number 84. <laughs> and we have a good laugh just by calling out a number. But I realize you can stay neutral in this situation. You don't get, have to get 
caught up, this is a Yiddish word, uh, mishigas. Right, right, Suzanne? <laughs> Susan? Uh, mishigas. It's like craziness. You don't have to get caught up in other people's craziness. You could stay neutral. Um, so there's another story from my book uh, illustrating that. Another funny story. And that's not it. <laughs> On a foggy night, a U.S. aircraft carrier was cruising off the coast of Newfoundland and junior radar operators spotted a light in the darkness. The radar person worked out that a collision was likely unless the other vessel changed its course. So we went on a radio message. <coughs> so we sent a radio message. Below is a transcript of what happened. Please divert your course at least seven degrees to the south to avoid a collision. Back came the reply. You must be joking. I recommend you divert your course instead. The radar officer referred the matter to the superior officer and reported the incident as insubordination. As a result, the captain of the aircraft carrier sent a second message. I believe that I outrank you and am giving you a direct order to divert your course now. Now, I say, now. What came back was, this is a lighthouse, your call. <laughs> <laughs> so another of the wake up calls <laughs> is to learn to let go. Because sometimes we hold on to stuff so much, you know, we needed to put it back, and it st still, it still angers us. It still upsets us. There's a wonderful Zen story about two monks uh, related to that, and they were walking down the road, and one of the monks uh, sees a woman ready to cross, so he the, the, cross the river. So he picks up the woman, carries her across the river, and puts the woman down. About a mile down the road, one of the monks, the one who did not pick up the woman, turns to the one who did and says, you know, um, we're not supposed to look at a woman. We're not supposed to even you know, be near women. How did you happen? Why did you pick that woman up and carry her across the river? And the other monk who did that said, I put the woman down a mile back. Are you still carrying her around with you? Oh. How often, folks, you carry stuff around from the past Guarantee it's going to ruin your day. So one of the ways to let go is of stuff of the past and make sure it doesn't keep ruining your day. Most of you have these little uh, finger traps. Would you take that out? Put your fingers in. <laughs> what happened? You pull and you pull, you pull, you couldn't get out. You can't get out, right? What is the trick to getting out? Relax. Relaxing, letting go. See, the more you resist stuff, the more it persists. The more you're angry or upset, the more it gets in the way of you enjoying your life. You've got to start letting go. Kodak picture spot? <laughs> You've got to start letting go. Let it go, let it go, yes. And I like... You Prather says, when you're relaxed and flexible, you are happy. When you are rigid and controlling, you are unhappy. So the key is letting go of the urge to get people to behave and events to go your way. How often do we try to change other people? You cannot do that. You are the only person that can do that. So one of the ways you can do that is to play a little more. So uh, wake up call number 42 is to uh, let the play begin. And part of that, we're going to sing a song right now to illustrate something I want to talk about. And the song is My Body Lies Over the Ocean. I think most of you know it, but if you don't, I have the lyrics right here. So um, this is the way, why don't you clear your throats first so we can sing. <laughs> this is the way the... Uh, the song goes, every time you come to a word with B in it, like Bonnie, you'll stand up. 
Second word with the B, like Bonnie, you'll sit down. Third word with the B, you'll stand up, so on and so forth. You got that? No, but I'll try. You'll try. Okay, every B word, you're up or down. And to make it a little more interesting, I'm going to turn it off. <laughs> okay, you're ready. One, two, three. My body lies over the ocean. My body lies over the sea. My body lies over the ocean. Oh, bring back my body to me. Bring back, bring back. Oh, bring back my body to me, to me. Bring back, bring back. Oh, bring back my body to me. I'll give you a standing ovation. I know some of you are thinking maybe I should have been standard or seated at the end. Yeah. It doesn't matter. The reason I asked you to do the game, because if you get it to game playing, you forget about your problems. You forget about your anger and upset. So let the play begin. One other little play thing. Most of you have balloons that got here um, before, and I gave you a balloon. Take it out, give it a couple of big stretches. Now think about some little thing that makes you angry, upset, frustrated, and see if you can blow that into the balloon and then hold on to it. <laughs> Okay, when I count to three, you're going to let go of the balloon and let go of anything that was ruining your day that was inside of you. Ready? Oh. Oh. I don't know if you saw what I saw, but some people got hit by other people's stress. <laughs> But what I'm talking about is using some uh, play to change the way you see things. And another wake up call is uh, Don't Worry, Be Happy, number 41. And I want to show you a little video because people think, well, I can't be happy until I have the right job. I can't be the happy until I have the right relationship. I can't be happy until I have the right house. You know, and it's kind of backwards. You can always be happy. And I want to show you this little video. It's um, Sam Burns. Some of you may have seen him. He has progeria, which means he aged. He lived till 18. Mm -hmm. But it's a rare disease. Not many people in the country have it. And uh, you're a child, but you look really old because the aging process is speeded up. And he talks about what it takes to be happy. I was asked, what is the most important thing that people should know about you? And my answer was, simply, that I have a very happy life. I have a disease called progeria. It affects only about 350 kids today, worldwide. Even though there are many obstacles in my life, with a lot of them being created by progeria, I had to be brave. And it wasn't always easy. Sometimes I faltered, I had bad days, but I realized that being brave isn't supposed to be easy. And for me, I feel it's the key way to keep moving forward. I'm okay with what I ultimately can't do, because there's so much that I can do. I wanted to play snare drum in the Foxborough High School marching band. And it was a dream that I just had to accomplish. But each snare drum and harness weighed about 40 pounds, so logistically I really couldn't carry a regular sized snare drum. However, nothing was gonna stop me from playing snare drum with the marching band in the halftime show. So after continuous work, too, my family and I worked with an engineer and made a snare drum apparatus that weighs only about six pounds.
being in a group like the band is that the music that we make together is true, it's genuine, and it supersedes progeria. So I don't have to worry about that when I'm feeling so good about making music. I'm extremely lucky to have an amazing family who have always supported me throughout my entire life. And I'm also really fortunate to have a really close group of friends at school. Now we're uh, kind of goofy, but we really enjoy each other's company and we help each other out when we need to. We see each other for who we are on the inside. This award is given to students who have a grade point average of 90% or more, Sam Burns. I feel like I'm at my highest point when I'm with people that surround me every day. It provides real positive influences in my life, as I hope that I can provide positive influence in theirs as well. And as I'm striving to change the world, I will be happy. Pretty good, huh? <laughs> Norman Vince Appeal told us, when I wake up in the morning, I have two choices. I can be happy or I can be unhappy. I'm not an idiot. I choose to be happy. And Sam shows us that no matter what, you can be happy. So just a couple more wake up calls. These two kind of go together, get out of the way and stop struggling. Um, and what was I going to tell you about that? Ah, I know, from my own life. The publisher of this book. This is the seventh book with this publisher. And prior to this, I had a number of uh, quotation books, motivational uplifting quotation books with Random House. They closed that division. I got the rights back. And for a year and a half, I tried to sell the rights to another company. And I couldn't do it. So I put this sign above my computer, and I saw it every moment of the day I was at the computer. It said, the perfect publisher will find me. I got out of the way. I stopped struggling. This is on my computer, right in front of my computer, for about three months. Then I went to a writer's meeting, chairs like this. I sat on the aisle. man next to me turned around to two women. He's trying to sell them his book, and I hear them say, we have a very successful publishing company, but we're starting a new division, and we're looking for uplifting, motivational, <laughs> inspirational books. And I turned around, and I said, I have, um, at that time, five of them ready to go. And they said, um, why don't you send them to us? And they gave me their business card. I looked at it. Their office was five blocks away from where I live. Oh, so I brought the books to them the next day, and they started to publish them. And then they got too small, uh, too big, rather, for this small office. So they moved to Berkeley, and they invited me to the opening party. And I walk in the door, and this woman comes up to me, and she says, we're so glad um, that you're with us. I own this company. You don't know me. I'm not around a lot. I lived in, in London, but um, I know you. I said, you, I, you don't look familiar. She said, yes, I lived across the street from you for about 10 years, and I'd watch you walk your dog every single day. The perfect publisher found me. Sometimes you just have to let go, get out of our own way, and stop struggling, and things will come to us. Also, the tap into the power of words. I just, I won't say much about that. I'll just show you this video. It's about a blind man sitting on the street and says, please help me, um, I'm blind. And then somebody comes along and changes the words, and you'll see how powerful um, that was. <laughs>
and it could help you not let anyone ruin your day. So the very last um, wake-up call is to set your intention. And Albert Einstein reminds us that the most important decision we make is whether we believe we live in a friendly world or a hostile world. So I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Are you willing to change your view of the world from a hostile one to a friendly one? Yeah. Are you willing to get out of the way and stop struggling? Sure. Are you willing to let go of things that don't serve you? Yes. Are you thank you. Are you willing to focus on positive words and thoughts? Yes. Yes. And finally, are you willing to not let anything or anyone ruin your day? Sure. Yes. Yes. Great. So, a final thing, I'd like to ask you to take a. Um, you Can't Ruin My Day pledge, and I have them on the back of these cards if you'd like to come up and get one to keep in your wallet or around. So would you please all raise your right hand, take your right index finger and put it on your nose, take your left hand and hold your earlobe, and now take the pledge and repeat after me. Starting Sorry, right, right now, now. I, I will take back my power and not let anyone or anything ruin my day. So help me over your free. That's it, folks. You should be a comedian. What? You should be a comedian. I should be a comedian? Well, I make my living by uh, teaching humor workshops. Not, a, not exactly a stand-up comedian. By the way, if anyone has any questions, is that okay? If we're yeah. Any questions? questions? Is your name Carol? Yeah. If not, I'll be up here. I'll be up here to sign books or answer questions. Yes? Fine. What if you had something happen, but the thing is now you're looking to, uh, to face further consequences in, in weeks ahead? Like, for example, okay, I got a traffic ticket. I not only got a traffic ticket, I mean, it, this was like, you know, we all know that it involves traffic school. It, has paid a, it involves paying a huge fine. Maybe community service and all that. Well, that that's all passed now and everything. I mean, I paid. I just paid it all one big fat fine and went that amount, right? But then I find out I get something in the mail, finding out that she, the officer also reported me to the re-exam department. So I have to go through this whole re-exam with DMV now, and I, I'm scheduled for a couple months from now. So I'm still I still have it hanging over my head. So it's kind of hard for me to shake it because I got I'm now a little worried. I'm afraid I'm like nervous when I'm going to give me a long driving test and. Maybe I'll do something wrong because I'm nervous having somebody scrutinizing me while I'm driving and taking me out of my comfort zone into roads that are strange to me. I don't know what to expect next. And just, I'm just thinking about all this stuff and I'm worrying about it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, I don't, and people do? are laughing as you're telling that? your story, which is kind of amusing. Yeah. Um, who could change all that? I mean, I, I can try to think positive. I have, I'm, I'm alternating between thinking positive. Oh, I could. I, what am I worried about? I've had to drive for driving 38 years, you know? What, why am I so worried? And know? what's the worst thing that could happen? I might take, they might take away my driving privilege. And what's the mistake? worst thing would happen if they took away your driver's license? Oh, I'm lost without my, my car. And what was the worst thing if you're lost without a car? Oh, I, I'm thinking about, like, shopping, buying huge bags of litter for my cats. What's the worst thing? All <laughs> what's the worst thing? I'm thinking about... The cat would starve. I'm thinking about getting quarters for the lunch, you but might, I would take a you bus might, for it. You might need <laughs> more new friends, <laughs> you know, who help you get there. I mean, there's a whole... That you're only looking at it one way. This yeah. is, you, you know, it's right there. It's this block. You can go around <laughs> it. 
you can you can enjoy it. Oh, I loved it. I love what I'm going through. I mean, you can see it differently. I you know, I, I try you know maybe I'll meet a, a really handsome young man in the police department, <laughs> and, and maybe he's even rich. I mean, what I'm saying is you can look at it this way, that this is, or you can look at it, hey, this is a great thing, this is a great opportunity. It's up to you. Okay. No one else can do it. We've got time for about two more questions. But I think the lights go out. But I think you just said, we were all laughing as you told the story. Just think of how much, as Ellen said, what an amusing piece of conversation you have, because there isn't one of us that hasn't, maybe <coughs> I've gotten tickets in Antigua. But you know, we all relate to that. So really, it's to think of it as, this is a bit of material that came into my life, and I'm going to use it. To these people, like right. you pointed out. And you know, if you were a professional speaker, we love those kind of stories because <laughs> then we have, you know, something we could joke about, talk about, people will relate to. Um, it's all like grist for the mill. And even though you're not a speaker, it's still grist for the mill for you. If nothing else, how can this make you grow? How can you see this a little differently? How, you know, just. It's an opportunity, rather than looking at it as a challenge, and it is a challenge, but look at it as an opportunity. What is in this for me? What can I get from this? Okay. And, and it just changes your thinking. Okay, thank you. Yes? Did you think about developing one of them into a book, like the one with the games? I need more games and songs like that. Uh -huh. <laughs> Do you have any? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Actually, I have a book, but it's for therapists, and it has 60 oh, okay, different um, techniques therapists can use with their patients to help get more laughter and play and joy in their life. The book is called L-A-U-G-H, because each letter stands for something. L, let go. A, change your attitude. U, a Y, O, you need to G, go do it. And H, open your humor, eyes and ears, and look and listen for humor. But there's 60 activities. Maybe the library might have it. <laughs> Check it out. Or they can order it from you, for you. Okay. Thank you. And they, yes. I don't know if I should say this on. Um, I was working for these two attorneys in San Rafael for the last nine months, really hard, doing an excellent job, above and beyond. And so I asked for a well-deserved vacation. So I told them, and they approved the vacation. So while I was in Hawaii for 10 days, I just got back yesterday. I didn't check my email for a few days, and what, the sixth day into my vacation, they, they let me go. They fired me on my well-deserved vacation. Mm -hmm. okay, <laughs> and so it's like I was At least you got a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you have to, um, when you go on vacation there, you get fired. I don't know, but I, I let it ruin. It, I was numb walking around for a day on my, in Hawaii, and then I started having fun again. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know. You know, a number of people I've met that lost college. their job, and then I questioned them further, and they go, yeah, I didn't really like that yeah. job. I didn't like the bosses. They were abusive. Yeah. She was one of the most abusive there attorneys ah, they, I've ever worked for. Yeah, and he go. wasn't far behind. Mm -hmm. You'll find something better. <laughs> yeah. Better boss. You know, yeah. it's just... Again, how do you look at it? Right. Okay, we'll do last question right here. Well, it's not a question. It's just something that someone told me years ago. They said, always look for the yes within a situation. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the yes in the situation. Yeah, you have the choice. Always have that choice. Was that the last one you said? Great. I thank, thank you so much, all Alan. For